Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to the Spring 2020 Dean's Forum presented by the Student Aviation Advisory Council. My name is Zach Dabrowski, and I'm the president of SAC. Joining us tonight are members of the Aviation Faculty and Flight Operations Department to provide you updates and answer your questions. Thank you, Zach. So my name is Gretchen Cohn. I'm the Director of Public Outreach for SAC. Um, real quickly, I'm going to introduce you the other members of our council. So from left to right, we have Patrick Verner. He is the Director of Student Outreach. Drew Lawrence, the Director of Industry Relations. Amanda Higginbotham, the Director of Programming. Zach Kretschmar, the Vice President. Zach Dabrowski, who you just met, the President. Nick Nine, the Treasurer. Stephen Smith, the Director of Technology. And Ryan Nipping, who is our Secretary. As SAC, we serve three primary roles. Number one is to voice student concerns, feedback, and ideas to the Aviation Department Administration, work on projects to improve the student experience within our department, and aid in communication between the Aviation Department Administration and our students. If you want to get in contact with us, we are continuously monitoring our email. Um, that is sacskyward at gmail.com and all of our social media, which are um, Instagram and Facebook accounts. Or if you wanna learn more about SAC, you can visit our website. That's sac.arrow.und.edu. So please feel free to contact us about anything. We try to be as accessible as possible and we're here for everybody in the department. So earlier this week, as a council, we met with the faculty and staff to discuss how the first week of online classes went well of other, as well as other relevant things within the program. Um, so that's just kind of speaks to how we are in a liaison between the students and the faculty, just trying to get your feedback to those who need to hear it. After our first industry speaker presentation, Endeavor Air reached out to us to let us know that they are still fully committed to continuing the STEP program. In order to show Endeavor's continued support, they are setting up a giveaway for UND students. All you have to do is update your STEP profile by May 15th and you will be entered in a drawing to win a CRJ model. You can find out more information by checking out our SAC Instagram and continuing to attend the industry speaker presentations. And as of today, our application window to join SAC is now open. So if you are interested in joining SAC, please head to our website, fill out our application and submit your application by April 17th. And now here's Dean Paul Linseth to give you all an update on the Aerospace College. Thank you very much, Zach and Gretchen. And thanks to all the SAC members for all they do uh, throughout the year to ensure we have the highest quality program here at the University of North Dakota. I think this might be the first uh, Dean's SAC forum that's been held online. In fact, we're sure of that, but uh, I appreciate everybody tuning in. And uh, we wanna give you an update obviously on the college, but uh, obviously I'll answer a lot of your questions in regards to the COVID uh, circumstances that we're going through. But I wanted to start off uh, with our mission and vision statement, just reminding everybody uh, uh, what our focus is and uh, what our vision is for the organization. And obviously it's uh, teaching research and service uh, at uh, delivering that at the highest quality level possible and serving our, not only our university state, uh, but also the worldwide aerospace community because we do have a worldwide reach here at UND Aerospace. And that's why our vision statement is leading the world in aerospace education and research. So that's our focus. Uh, next slide is I wanted to show you our core values that we adopted last year and uh, specifically uh, two of our core values, the first one and last one, safety and resilience. Uh, Certainly during this crisis, uh, our focus is on safety as it always is. We've got a great safety officer, uh, Brian Willis, that, that guides us in this direction as well as the entire organization. But uh, we do have to put the students, uh, staff and faculty's uh, safety first and paramount. And, and that's why we're in the situation we are with uh, no flying here at, at uh, UND Aerospace and online classes. So. But the last one, resilience, I wanted to point that one out. 
because uh, this is a resilient organization. We've been going for 52 years as, uh, as we celebrated our 50th a couple years ago. But uh, we, we will uh, be back full strength when this is over. Uh, I mean, we were shut down for a considerable length of time uh, during the flood of 97, like over two, two months time period and, and a shutdown after 9-11 for a while. So uh, we will be back full strength, and I just wanted to point out those two uh, core values that that are at the core of our uh, our being here at uh, UND Aerospace. Just some updates uh, from the dean's office, and basically, uh, uh, I've been given this speech uh, throughout my career as far as my three P speech, but. It seems now more more than ever it's very appropriate during these extraordinary times and and I just pass this on as uh, these three characteristics have certainly helped me and throughout my my career but we we'd certainly have to have perseverance as we deal with this constantly changing situation each and every day, but you certainly at the same time need to have a lot of patience too because it seems like every day is longer and things take so much longer to progress and and we get new information every day that you have to adjust to but the persistence level needs to also stay there if this is what you really want to do you just persist through it and achieve your goals so all three of those things together, they're a balance. Some, some contradict others, but you have to have all three of those to make it through these times. And with, the, all working, with us all working together, we'll get through this and uh, be on the other side and look back on it and have some, hopefully some good memories about it. As far as flight training at UND, uh, Oops, excuse me for the phone call there, but the uh, flight training, we're continuing to work uh, daily with the president and provost as far as restarting flight training. That's, that's a daily thing with incoming information and with uh, our focus always on the students, we want to restart flight training as soon as possible, but we keep safety in mind as a, as a paramount concern. And finally, there is uh, from the Dean's office thanking you as the students for the smooth, smooth transition to online uh, learning is certainly an, a huge adjustment. We appreciate all the um, things that you're going through to accomplish this and uh, not only to the students, but the faculty and staff as well. So, okay, next slide. Some highlights that I wanna point out, uh, go through some things and then we'll turn it over to the aviation department. But uh, as we do each, each Dean's form, I wanna point out some highlights. Uh, uh, that have occurred uh, over the past few months since we had our last Dean's Forum. And I wanted to congratulate Dr. Kim Kenbo. She was appointed to the National Academy of Sciences Airport Cooperative Research Program Oversight Committee. She got a personal letter from Secretary of Trans Transportation Chow and it's a four year term. So we're very proud of Kim to be on that committee. As you may have heard, Dr. Mark Askelson has been uh, appointed as our Associate Dean for Research within the Order Guard School. He, is, uh, he was uh, serving or is still serving as the director of the RISE group, which is the Research in Institute for Autonomous Systems at the University of North Dakota. Now he's, his other 50% time uh, will be with the Odegaard School Dean's Office. And we're very happy to have uh, Dr. Quasi uh, get a $755,000 grant from the National Academy of Science uh, in conjunction with the UND's Petroleum Engineering Department, studying offshore oil, oil rig safety procedures using his background in aviation. So congratulations to Quasi. If you, have, if you haven't congratulated him, please do so. Our flying, flying team did well at the regions last fall, uh, placing first, and our aerobatic team placed second overall, bringing home uh, 10 of the last 12 years of first place championships and second in the other two years. So congratulations uh, students and advisors and, and uh, coaches on those two teams. Thank you so much for your work. We, did a, we had another first in the Odegaard School in uh, late November when Korean Airlines uh, visited us and we signed the agreement for the first international pathway program for our Korean students to uh, uh, with Korean Airlines for them to 
transition to Korean Air once they complete their degrees here at the University of North Dakota. So then that was another first for the Odegaard School. And we had another, we had a visit from General Raymond. You probably heard that there was a new armed services branch uh, formed uh, right before Christmas called Space Force. And the first commander of that branch of service uh, is uh, General Raymond. And he came and visited us in early January uh, with the, uh, in, by the invitation of Senator Kramer. And we're gracious uh, for Senator Kramer to bring him here. And it was a great visit. Uh, uh, the general's wife was a graduate, of the, is a graduate of the University of North Dakota. And General Raymond served out here at the Grand Forks Air Force Base in his career in the Air Force. So it, it was just great visit. There's lots of possibilities in research uh, as we go forward for the, for the uh, college. And also right before Christmas, uh, we finally got the Air, Air Traffic Control Hiring Reform Act passed, thanks to Senator Hoven, which will help our graduates in the Air Traffic Control Program, hopefully uh, be able to assimilate into the FAA control jobs uh, much more efficiently. Three professional advisors uh, in the Odegaard School, you all know Dr. Kim Higgs. Uh, uh, but uh, we hi also, also hired Lindsay Archer and Carla Spokley in that area to serve uh, your needs in your advisement. And Community Day again was a huge success. Got lots of pictures there with uh, what went on, but thank you uh, to all the students that uh, helped volunteer. We had over uh, 200 volunteers that Saturday from 10 to 3 and, and uh, I just deeply appreciate them of all your work to put that on. Such a great event for the community. The community loves it, the, but especially the kids love it. And thank you so much. And our aviation industry speaker series, we started that last Thursday. Uh, thanks uh, to uh, Dr. Brandon Wild and Dr. Jim Higgins and uh, our Chester Fitz Distinguished Professor Kent Loveless for kicking off the first series last Thursday. But tomorrow night we have our second one with uh, uh, three folks from the industry. Karen Ruth is a 330 captain, will be presenting along with uh, Dave Barnes and Jared Herndon from the industry perspective on helping you through this uh, turbulent time in the industry. That'll be great, great, and we sure appreciate their uh, willingness to uh, come on, on a webinar and, uh, and uh, connect with you. So in closing on my part here from the Dean's office, again, uh, our focus is always on the students and we certainly wanna thank you uh, for selecting us as uh, the place for your aviation education. We, we are working with you and, and we wanna ensure you uh, get to your degree as quick as possible and that's what we're working toward each and every day. So thank you so much for selecting us. So I'll turn it over to Brett and Lewis. Go ahead, guys. Thank you. Um, well, welcome everybody. Thanks, Dr. Linseth. My name is Brett Benheisen. I'm the uh, professor or professor in the aviation department and chair of the aviation department. And I've got a number of updates to share with you um, tonight about the busy time we've all had over the last couple of weeks. So, um, well, Monday of spring break, uh, it was announced that effective at noon that day, uh, UND would be removing to a, a remote work. And so the department immediately pivoted towards online education. Luckily, we have a pretty long history with online education through our graduate courses, um, but many of our undergraduate courses, it was you know new to those faculty members and new for those courses. So um, we were able to organize a number of training sessions for our faculty through uh, UND's TADA um, department who, who helped us with a lot of technology issues. Uh, our own Professor Shane Dachau immediately began recording and sharing training videos um, on all of the tools that we have available to us for online instruction. And that was just extremely helpful as we, as we adapted in that way. Um, we all adapted, we all learned to work with these new tools. And from what we're hearing so far from students and faculty alike, it's been going pretty smoothly. Um, so I, I know in my class, my aviation law section, we've had really no technical difficulties and the vast majority of the students are attending and, and things are going quite well. 
Um, you know, fairly early on in this process, uh, Dr. Bierke uh, realized that we needed a forum for providing information from the aviation industry to all of you. And so uh, we started an aviation industry speaker series. Um, we have a number of uh, attendees that have lined up to, to speak. Uh, we started last week with Dr. Higgins, Dr. Wild, and Professor Lovelace on the state of the aviation industry and their projections for how um, the industry would recover and what hiring would look like in the future. This was a major success. We've heard from a lot of folks out there in industry at airlines. We've heard from parents. We've heard from students that they've all enjoyed this perspective. And just as a reminder, if you missed that presentation, it's available on the UND Aerospace YouTube channel. We're going to continue to do these every Thursday at 5.30 p.m. As you saw in uh, Dean Linseth's presentation, um, the uh, uh, series for Thursday is going to feature some Delta pilots who are going to speak to you. Um, we continue to have very strong pathway programs in place with our industry partners. Uh, they're very interested in our program and they're very interested in our students and they all want to share information with you and, and connect with you. Um, UND Aviate was set to launch live on campus on uh, uh, March 26th and now they've moved that to launching virtually at our Aviation Speaker Series on Thursday, April 9th at 5.30 p.m. Central. So uh, please join us for that, uh, that launch in, in a couple of weeks. Um, academic advising. Uh, students all have their assigned academic advisors, their faculty academic advisors and the professional advisors. You still are assigned to those academic advisors. Please feel free to contact them, especially regarding career advice and, and other sorts of matters. As far as academic issues, we're going to more of an online uh, centralized advising process with our professional advisors to ensure that you're getting the best, most up-to-date academic advising possible um, while our faculty members are focusing on, on their courses um, that they're teaching this semester. We are going to be hosting Zoom webinar advising sessions. All of the times noted on this slide are central time and the Zoom link is also listed on this slide. Um, we, uh, if you will note, uh, have a special session set aside for air traffic management students um, for Tuesday, April 14th at 3 p.m. Uh, UAS faculty will be joining one of the sessions to answer UAS questions and we'll be announcing uh, what session they'll be joining. And one of the sessions gonna, is going to focus primarily on commercial aviation and our flight labs with uh, Professor Archer. So he will be available then as well. We also, um, the university recently announced that we would have SU grading as an option uh, for students this semester. And, and we've kind of changed the policies uh, involving SU grading. So how that's going to work is, if you don't select an SU option, you'll still be graded in the course as you normally would be with a letter grade. But if you would like to take the course SU, you have to opt in for each class that you would like to be SU in. That's, that's up to you. There is an online form that's being created and as part of applying uh, for the SU grading, you're required to speak to an academic advisor. But our online group advising is sufficient for that process. You need to select the SU option no later than reading and review day. Uh, so you've got much longer during the semester to choose whether or not you want to go SU. So you'll have a better idea of how you're progressing academically by the point where you're, you're, you need to make that decision. Um, it's okay to take SU classes if they're classes in your major. It's okay for freshmen to take SU classes. It doesn't impact the 30 credit limit that, that's normally in place for classes taken SU. So all of those things have, um, have been, uh, policies have been loosened up for you to be able to take advantage of that. Faculty members won't know whether you've selected SU. They'll still enter a letter grade for you. If you earn an A, B, or a C, your faculty member will enter that letter grade and the registrar's office will convert that to an S for satisfactory. If you earn a D or an F, the faculty member will enter that letter grade and the registrar's office will convert it to a U. The only group that really needs to be especially concerned um, about their decision-making process for SU grading is the VA students. So if you're a VA student, you, you probably don't want to select SU grading, but you definitely would want to talk to your academic advisor about that. 
Well, yesterday we got news that UND was going to be remote throughout the summer. So this led to more changes, more adapting, and more patience, hopefully. Um, we uh, re pretty much rewrote our summer schedule in very short order uh, yesterday and into today to make adjustments to it to accommodate uh, remote instruction for the summer. Registration will continue as scheduled for summer and fall. Um, some of the changes that we're making to the summer schedule include that all of our Part 141 flight courses are going to start on June 8th and they will be offered for a nine week period. This will allow a lot of flexibility for when Flight Ops is able to reopen so that students can uh, make progress on their flying. 221, AVIT 221 is an exception to that. It will start June 29th and will be a six week long course. We do have two sections of AVIT 480 that will be running and those sections will run as scheduled, um, but there will be some modifications made uh, in those courses that your instructors will talk to you about. Non-flight courses. Um, most of our non-flight courses are going to be moved toward, to the start of the summer. We've increased offerings. We've offered a number of additional classes than we were planning to have, and we may even add more as time goes on. We're, we're regularly reaching out to faculty members and seeing what they're willing to teach to give you more options to uh, get credits over the summer. We are working to offer more of these sections asynchronously, so they will be easier to work into your schedules and easier to uh, um, accommodate any flight training that you're doing at the time. We really anticipate a busy summer. Uh, we hope that more co course offerings will allow students to make better progress towards their degrees, maybe even get through courses where we've historically had some backlogs um, and be able to move ahead with your training. I also have some updates um, on our air traffic management degree. Um, the FAA is planning another ATC hiring announcement before the end of the fiscal year, so that's good news for our air traffic majors. The FAA Academy is currently closed, but classes are not canceled. Uh, students have been sent home until further notification um, as to when they're supposed to come back and continue with their training. Graduate, graduates with class dates at the academy, onboard training is being done online, and those um, academy or those graduates are being paid to conduct that onboard training. Professor Drexel will be attending the FAA ATCTI conference virtually uh, later this semester, and he will provide further updates after that conference. I also have some updates uh, regarding UAS and uh, the big updates here are plans for how things are going to work with the flight lab portions of the courses. So in AVIT 126, um, those students will receive a pass. They've already completed uh, enough to show satisfactory completion of the course goals um, with regard to the introductory UAS operations. So uh, they will receive a pass on the flight lab portion of the course. For AVIT 238, Students will be issued an SP grade until they're able to finish their AVIT 238 UAS flight training. UAS flight operations intends to work with the 238 academic course to determine when students are going to be able to come back and finish that training. For AVIT 337, students will be issued an SP until they're able to finish their AVIT 337 UAS flight training. UAS Flight Operations is going to work with those academic uh, courses to determine when they'll, that will be, when they'll be able to finish. For AVIT 438, um, the Flight Lab portion will receive a pass for satisfactory completion of that Flight Lab portion up to this point. The content covered in the one to two flights that haven't been able to be completed by the students, um, those principles will be taught during the academic portion of the class. So um, there won't be a lot of, a lot of impact there. If you're a student trying to graduate with your UAS major and you're running into some roadblocks related to the UAS courses, please first work with the professor for that course. They will work with Professor Paul Snyder, who is our assistant chair of UAS, to see what options are available to accommodate you um, and still meet the curriculum requirements. UAS Flight Ops is preparing just as airplane and helicopter flight ops are and is hoping to uh, start UAS flight training as soon as that flight training can safely be conducted. And we've also recently obtained um, a large amount of additional ScanEagle UAS equipment and the ScanEagle simulation has been updated to Boeing's most current version um, during this down period that we've had. So we're making good progress there. We have received a few general academic questions that um, I will address before we turn it over to Professor Archer. Um, 
So one of the questions has been, how will grading work in our classes for the rest of the semester? Well, as I just mentioned, um, based on the notice that came out yesterday, you'll be able to choose between whether you want to have a letter grade or whether you want to receive an SU for that class. So uh, reference my comments earlier in this presentation and reference the email and the communications that have gone out from, UA from UND to make sure that you um, are able to uh, make that change if you wish to. The second question that we're seeing quite a bit is, is the summer session confirmed? What about registration and course dates? Well, we've also uh, talked about that. Summer will be remote. We've expanded our offerings. We've rescheduled flight courses um, uh, for slightly later in the summer, and we're focusing on non-flight courses earlier in the sem semester, summer semester. Registration will continue as scheduled um, and uh, stand by as, as we progress through these changes and additions so that you can complete um, a lot of academic work over the summer. Um, the next question that we've seen a fair amount of is what semesters are you going to be registering for on April 6th? Well, summer and fall. Uh, registration is going to continue as normal. Finally, um, people are wondering about scholarships. Unfortunately, we've had to cancel our scholarship award ceremony and banquet this semester. Um, so the question is, if you've been awarded a scholarship, how will you find out about that and how will you receive that scholarship? Well, scholarships will still be awarded. That's good news. The letters are in progress as we speak. Those letters will be sent out before the uh, originally scheduled banquet date uh, and the funds will be credited as they normally are for scholarship awards. So um, we're not going to uh, be able to have a banquet or a ceremony, but uh, we are working on another way to honor our awardees and our donors, um, and uh, you will receive scholarships as, as normal. I will uh, turn it over now to Professor Lewis Archer, who will update you on some of our uh, more specific flight academic issues and questions that have come up. Professor Archer. All right, thank you. Um, so as uh, uh, Professor Van Heisen mentioned, uh, my name is Lewis Archer. I'm the Assistant Chair of Flight Academics uh, in the Aviation Department. Um, so a couple things I wanted to cover with you tonight. Uh, of course, uh, uh, an update to our, our Flight Academics uh, remote instruction. So um, as we're all aware by now, we did get approval from the FA to uh, provide our remote instruction. Um, uh, for the rest of the spring semester. So that uh, expires on May 15, 2020. Uh, we have submitted a request, uh, a similar request to allow for remote instruction over the summer. Uh, that was submitted uh, this afternoon. So hopefully we'll hear back uh, within the next few days as to whether that's been approved. Uh, I know there has been some questions about the SU grading and how that relates to flight courses. Um, so uh, flight courses are included in that. So if you would like to uh, uh, switch to an SU grade for a flight course, uh, that is approved, that is acceptable. Again, the, uh, the um, faculty member is gonna enter a, a letter grade, A, B, C, D, F, uh, and the same will, uh, will happen in Ames as well. So Ames, is, Ames serves as the official FAA record uh, for your uh, flight training. So that, that will continue to reflect the letter grade uh, however, if you choose the SU option, then the S or the U would uh, be reflected on your transcript. Um, one of the questions we did receive, so um, how will uh, we take flight course block exams if the FAA hasn't approved them to be online? So uh, the good news is part of our approval um, did allow for remote delivery of um, block exams and the final exam um, through uh, a testing platform on Blackboard or Easy or, or something along, that, uh, along those lines. So. Um, that is approved. We can still continue to deliver those exams remotely, uh, and we're planning to, to do that for the summer as well. That was part of our summer request. So, uh, additional question we had, uh, do you think the situation will change the way the FA reviews, uh, or reviews online ground instruction? Um, so, the, the FA has obviously been very flexible with us uh, lately, and, uh, and we certainly appreciate their flexibility and their uh, prompt responses um, uh, to our requests. Um, the the concept of an internet-based uh, ground training course uh, under Part 141 um, that's not a new concept. That's that's existed for several years in in the regulations. Um, so I do expect that you know this event will perhaps cause some some institutions, including ourselves, to maybe consider whether that might be an option that we could pursue uh, on a more permanent basis in the future. Obviously not all of our classes would be 
delivered online, but uh, that, that could be an option that we now have um, available to us uh, in the future. So I think there might be, uh, might be some adjustments there. Um, the uh, flight template uh, for summer and fall registration. So we uh, have reevaluated the requirements to sign up for a class in the summer and fall. Um, so we, we brought that, what we, what we would call the registration template, we brought that back uh, uh, basically to about February 28th or 29th uh, with a couple of modif modifications there for each course. But uh, the, uh, so that template has been relaxed. I'll show you that momentarily um, to allow to capture most students, allow most students to register for their next course. Uh, are exceptions going to be made to register for classes if you're not in flight template? So even with this new relaxed template, obviously we do realize that there's gonna be some students that still uh, don't quite meet the uh, requirement to reserve a seat in the next course. Um, we've always approached that on a case-by-case -case basis. So if there's some additional uh, exceptional circumstance, obviously we're all in an exceptional circumstance right now, but uh, if there's something above and beyond that that, that might have caused a, del a delay in your flight training, um, then that's something that we could uh, consider on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, that's best approached um, by contacting myself. We also have an email address, which is flight course, one word, flight course at aero.und.edu. Um, so we can funnel those, uh, those questions in to, uh, to that email address. Um, so again, the, uh, the, the requirements to register for a flight course, we have relaxed those significantly uh, due to our current situation. Um, we have also decided that if you are um, obviously still finishing up your, your prerequisite flight training, you will be permitted to, um, to basically sit in the next ground school. Um, so that will be approved and acceptable um, as we move into the summer and fall semester here. So the uh, re requirements to register for our summer and fall flight courses is what you see here. Um, so if we use 221, for example, so that's the course that a student intends to register for. Um, so in that scenario, that student would need to have completed 16 lessons in 102. Um, that's not necessarily the same as lesson one through 16. That's just saying that you need to have 16 completed lessons uh, in that course in AVIT 102 for you to sign up for 221. So um, as you can see, that number is slightly different between different flight courses. Um, but um, all kind of average out at that uh, uh, 14 to 16 number. Uh, AVA 325 is a little bit different um, just because there are a lot of uh, uh, subsequent courses that require 325 as a prerequisite uh, in the fall. So we wanna make sure that uh, we, we can allow uh, students to sign up for those 400 level courses uh, in the fall if they intend to take 325 in the summer semester. Okay, so as far as our registration system goes, um, there is uh, one change that's uh, different than, than what we've done in the past. So uh, in the past, we had a separate date for when flight lab selection would become available. That's no longer the case. Um, so once you are registered uh, for the flight course in Campus Connection, so you'll receive that authorization at a later date. Um, once you're registered in Campus Connection, uh, flight lab selection will be available approximately 24 hours after you registered in Campus Connection. Uh, it does take a little uh, time for Ames and Campus Connection to communicate, so that's the reason for that 24 hour uh, time window there. Um, another change is uh, when flight lab selection becomes available, um, all the flight labs will be uh, available for selection immediately. So. Um, what, what you see for flight lab availability, that's what it's gonna be. Um, and again, a reminder there is make sure you plan that out in your schedule as you're, as you're planning out your summer and fall schedules, make sure you have uh, space set aside uh, for a flight lab. So usually about four hours is, uh, is a good number to use. Um, so our flight labs uh, for each course, generally speaking, 102, 323, and 414 are generally daytime flight labs. And then our uh, 222 and 415 generally are more concentrated in the uh, evening hours. Uh, and then 221 and 325 don't have assigned times. Uh, they may have assigned days, but not necessarily assigned times, um, just because of uh, a lot of cross countries um, and other uh, factors in that course. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Dick Schultz, our Director of Flight Operations, and Jeremy Racer, our Chief Flight Instructor for Airplanes. 
Good evening, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dick Schultz. I'm the director of flight operations, and want to thank all of you for taking time to go away from Netflix and all those to join us this evening. But uh, I've been an employee here for 33 years at flight operations, and I thought I had seen it all. I've been through the flood and the 9/11 and all the ups and downs with the industry, but no way did we see this COVID-19 issue coming. Uh, but one thing I can assure you is we can work through this because I have seen this in the past because one thing we are very good at doing it's adapting to to change and to make the situation work. So just bear with us and uh, we'll get through this. So next slide. Um, one thing I want to get across is flight operations is not closed. Now that does not mean you should come out here because uh, flight training has been suspended. Our doors are locked for students in that regards. But we are still operational as a unit. Uh, our maintenance crew is in full operation and they have been since we closed down. This has allowed us to catch up on all our phase inspections. We've moved up some of our engine changes that we had and uh, other things that we worked on. We're working on some camera installations and some of the archers, but basically the good news is when we do resume flying, the fleet is gonna be ready to fly. It's probably in the best shape it's ever been in. So that's good news. Uh, we've also had a records crew has been working out here. They're still working on the records process. We've been able to issue uh, some temporaries, get those sent out, and they're able to catch up. And we're also looking at our procedures and records too, so we can be able to keep up with everything when we do come back online for flying. Also, we've been working with the university. We already have procedures in place, which have been approved by the president and provost for when we do come into, when we do get the okay to resume training. So we already have that in place and we are continuing to still work on that. Uh, we're meeting with uh, still professionals in the field to make sure our procedures they feel are, are good enough or what or things that we can do to make them better. So we're working on that as well. A little bit other good news we have is we did order some new uh, archers and seminoles, which are, I found out, are pretty much ready to go in uh, Florida for us to pick up. And once the travel bans have been lifted, we will try to get those aircraft here. But our plan was to replace some of our older aircraft, but we will be able to hold on to some of those for a while and that'll allow us to also have some extra aircraft on the field, uh, which will also help our maintenance keep up and again, help everything move along on a smoother basis as we try to resume, resume training. So I thought I'd get to the first question that everybody is all waiting for me to answer is when will flight training resume? Um, it's, there's way too many factors for us right now to, to answer that question. Uh, there's stuff involved federally, uh, statewide, locally, university guidance. Uh, we're all still learning about this disease and, and how it works. Uh, but that said, we're trying to, our goal is to try to be operational sometime in May. Mid-May is when we would like to be operational for sure by June. Uh, so as we learn more and we get more information, we'll pass that along. I am meeting constantly with uh, UND leadership to, to work on that factor so we can get you a more definite answer so you can make some plans for yourself in the future. We just ask for your patience as, you know, uh, as everybody has to have in this situation, we will work on that. So we'll get those updates to you when we can. Uh, the 14 day quarantine period is a question that's been coming up. Right now, the state does have a requirement that if you come back into the state of North Dakota, you do have to do a 14 day self quarantine. Uh, so we're asked if you're gonna have to comply with that. So as of today, the information that we have yes, that guidance is gonna to have to be followed unless that changes prior to you coming back. So don't rush back to Grand Forks because again, we don't have a date to start and that's why we're trying to work on that to get that information. So if that 14 day is still in effect, we can let you know, we can, we can work with that information as we move forward. Um, realistic, how long will flight ops be set back? Uh, there's a lot of things that come into play and uh, really it, it's a matter of, you know, our experience really comes into play here. Like I said, I was here for the flood in 97 and we thought we'd never see a situation. And we were shut down then for two months. And it really didn't take us that long to get ourselves back up to speed and get everything back on track. In my opinion, it's gonna take us for sure through the summer and into the fall, but hopefully by spring, we got things back in order. Uh, the nice thing about summer, it's uh, great weather, long days, 18 hours of daylight. We're gonna have those extra aircraft on hand. The big question is gonna be the CFIs. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to, Jeremy's going to talk a little bit more about the CFIs, but you know, data we're going to be collecting or trying to get from you as well as our CFIs, because our CFIs are scattered of our 200 CFIs. They're all around the country, just like our students are all around the country. And we're going to have to get those CFIs back. We're going to have to get them current. 
We're gonna have to get them back up to speed in that regard. So we're in this, during this month of April, we're gonna be collecting a lot of data so we can get a feel for that in that regard. So in essence, I think we will be able to catch up through the summer and into the fall semester, so. Uh, limited flight training, you see that term's getting thrown around once in a while. Uh, one thing we just wanna make you sure of, again, and this comes back to the CFIs, we don't know how many CFIs we're gonna have immediately available once we throw this switch, because they're gonna, again, have to come back, deal with the quarantine issues probably, and getting them trained. But as we collect that data, when we do come back online, we're not gonna say everybody show up on a Monday. That's just not realistic because we have to verify our procedures and we're gonna go through it slowly uh, and bring on students uh, at a sta staggered process. And that kind of depends again on that data that we get back. We're gonna try to work mostly with the upperclassmen first because they're the ones that are working on graduation requirements and trying to get out for jobs and that kind of stuff. And plus, if we can get those guys done first, because those are the courses primarily CFI, and multi-engine that we've had a lot of backlog because we've been hurting for CFIs in that region. So we're gonna try to get to them first so we can bring them in a staggered point. We can create some more availability and room for the other students as they come on schedule. So again, there'll be more news to follow on that as we get more data in the future. Uh, we're also asked about, if, are we gonna increase flight fees because of this situation? The answer to that simply is no. Uh, we have already had this decision made past November. We have to provide this information to the university already like for the follow for next year, I have to have that information by usually October. So this last October we visited, you know, with the university, we looked at our needs and so forth. And uh, we already did that. And as of 815, there will be some new rates that go into effect, but it had nothing to do with the COVID-19. And you're talking very minimal, uh, just as a thing, uh, I think the Archer went up $2 an hour and some of the other aircraft went up $2 an hour. So you're not gonna see a large effect on that as far as your flight fees go. There will be the issue though of currency that some students that are gonna need to do when they come back, obviously. And that's kind of dependent upon your course and on an individual basis, but there will be some increased costs in that regards. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeremy because he's my main guy when it comes to the CFI hiring. Good evening, folks. Um, real quick, CFI hiring. Um, we had the March class, the May class. Uh, the March class has been deferred. Uh, all those CFIs are, are going to be on staff. They've been deferred to May. The May hiring, uh, we were fully planning on doing it, but with uh, the shift of online classes and the, uh, the need of the 14-day quarantine and our current restrictions, we may have to adjust those dates uh, for the May hiring. Um, but will it happen? Yes, ab absolutely. We are going to continue to hire flight instructors. Um, we do expect to hire also at the July-August timeframe. So there's a lot of flight instructor hiring that's going to be going on. Um, there's some questions rolling in asking about CFI shortage and will, be, will, will we be properly staffed. Um, as Dick said, this is more about the ramp up to, to get back to full operations, but I'm expecting to have more CFIs on staff than we have in, in quite um, many years. Um, we are being contacted by graduates and alums that are out there in the industry right now just doing some future planning in case they need a short-term job back here at UND. So I do expect to have enough uh, uh, CFI hiring uh, going on. Um, next up, the flight training expectations, uh, piggybacking on what Lewis and, and Dick talked about. The initial plan for flight training this summer is, uh, uh, as was mentioned, the limited flight training. We can't have all the flight students come back uh, right away and start training. When, when we uh, started in January, there were uh, 1,400 students on the flight schedule. We cannot have 1,400 students show up in May and June and, and hit the flight line. We're gonna do a, a staggered approach. We have new summer courses that are starting. We have students that need to finish up their flight training. Um, so we may run a secondary poll or registration system to have students start back up in May and June and July, just to keep everything streamlined across the summer to get uh, as much flight training done as possible. Um, a lot of questions coming in about prereqs and uh, being in the summer courses. Uh, keep in mind the registration system that is set to reserve a seat that those uh, course requirements and that's also going to be the uh, prereq to be in the course. So we know the majority of the students out there have a course and a half to do this summer. We, we fully know that and that's the plan. 
Um, other questions coming in are, are we gonna show priority to students that are further ahead in their courses or even done? And uh, that could be, we haven't made a final decision on that, but um, again, uh, we have to control the, the overall activity rate of what's going on because we can't have everybody showing up June 1st uh, right away and, and, and to go. We, we will uh, do this as efficiently as possible. Um, to help with that, students need to be ready. Um, there's a lot of downtime right now, so being ready uh, for when your flight training resumes, that's the studying and the preparation, um, and uh, just be uh, without delay when you do get back to Grand Forks and cleared to fly, let's, let's be ready uh, to, to do that, both flight training and um, FAA knowledge exams. Um, some questions regarding course requirements. Next slide, please. Um, one specific question, 323 and 415 have had uh, specific course requirements in the semester where they, they uh, have a lower probability at the end. Uh, those requirements are thrown out at this time. We're gonna treat all courses the same. Um, some questions coming in about the 12 month requirement. The 12 month requirement is still going to exist for new courses. So courses this summer, yes, uh, th that 12 month requirement is going to be there. But we are addressing the deadlines that are approaching here in May and June. And then again in August, we are monitoring that and uh, we'll work with the FAA regarding those requirements. The students that are affected by that will get direct communication. Um, some students are asking uh, if they can contact the flight training staff with questions and the answer is yes. I mean, we're all working remotely. We all, we all have email. Um, so if you need to contact a uh, assistant chief flight instructor, by all means do it. Uh, they, they are available to answer those questions. Um, specific questions coming in, so, it, and I pretty much answered this already, so a student that's finishing uh, flight training for 102, can they register for 221 this summer? Yes. Um, th this applies to all courses. Uh, 480 is a little bit different, but uh, like I said, we're, we're ready to do a course and a half this summer um, in, a, in a controlled environment. It's just once we figure out all these variables of, uh, of going in. So with that, We'll turn it over to the Q&A. All right, thank you everyone for uh, giving updates on your uh, respective departments. So uh, Dick, the first question is for you. Um, how is UND Aerospace doing financially as our aircraft aren't making any money and just sitting in the hangars? Uh, that's a good question. Actually, we are sitting pretty good at this time. Um, I've been meeting with the Dean's office and our fiscal department we are probably in the best financial position we've been in for quite some time, just simply because we've had very good flying and good enrollment over the last few years. We've also just finished a fleet transition where we were selling our 172s and replacing with archers at a time where a lot of other flight schools were looking for airplanes. So we were able to get some money to help us out, put, say put it in the bank to help us get through this period. Will it last us forever? No, but I feel it's very, it, it'll be good enough to get us through this, to get us back into operation this summer. All right, and the next question is for Jeremy. How will flight, uh, or how will finishing flight courses work in the summer if they're not planning on enrolling in any classes? Uh, no different than a spring or fall semester. So we, we know the students that are not done and, and working on their, their flight training. The question is, what students are planning to return this summer to finish their flight training and what students are, are simply going to wait for fall semester. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, what, one of our next um, uh, tasks is that we will uh, poll the students or simply have the students go through a secondary registration system of what students are coming back this summer. And based upon that demand, we may create a schedule and say this student is invited back in June, this student is invited back in July and we tackle the uh, flight training as efficiently as we can throughout the summer. For uh, Lewis or Brett, will uh, class drop deadlines be extended due to the new circumstances? I can take that one. Um, I answered that on online as well, um, but uh, we haven't heard of any drop deadlines being extended at this point. If that is done, then of course, UND will make an announcement to that effect. All right, and for Lewis, um, for students who completed the 325 ground school but did not have time to complete the flight lab, 
will they still be able to register in 400 level AVIT courses where 325 is a prerequisite? Yes, so um, if you are currently in 325 uh, or if you register for 325 over the summer, um, you would be eligible to sign up for a 400 level course um, in the subsequent semester. Um, now there, there is one complication with that. If, uh, if a uh, SP grade is posted to your transcript for 325, uh, that would require a uh, override or a permission number. Um, so we're trying to uh, determine if there's an efficient way to handle that. Um, but at this time, if, if there's uh, been nothing posted to your transcript for 325, then you would be able you would be able to sign up for that 400 level course through Campus Connection. For uh, for Brett, since there is only one session of summer flight courses rather than an early and a late summer session, are you offering more sections to accommodate more students? We're adjusting our offerings um, as we go here and monitoring the demand and making those decisions uh, you know, as, as the process continues. So uh, we anticipate being able to accommodate everyone. All right, and for Lewis or Brett, um, if a student has not completed the flying for the current course, but finished the ground school, will they be able to enroll in the next flight course this summer? That has kind of already been address if you want to add anything to that yep so yep same responses last time uh, they would be eligible to register for the next course i guess i can ask this one for lewis um are you still binded by flight template in order to register for a flight course given um, no ones on template how will that work um so yeah with that uh if you if you meet that template requirement that we um, showed earlier um if, if you have those number of completed lessons done um then you would be able to sign up for that uh, uh subsequent flight course we we are not going to require that you be finished uh with that prerequisite training to take the next ground school for jeremy for those of us that are graduated but still working as a cfi how are we supposed to know whether to re-sign a lease or not for the summer? While all of us appreciate the frequent communication, there, has been a, there hasn't been anything communicated to the students or employees that is actually helpful towards making these big decisions. Yeah, I saw, I saw that question and uh, um, we're trying. I mean, like, like all of us have said, there's a lot of unknowns. We, we don't have an, a definite date of when we can resume flight training. What I have said and what has been sent out is that everyone's job is safe. Um, any flight instructor on staff um is is welcome to come back and, and has a job um if uh um, we resume flight training in may uh we full we want to bring back flight instructors a week early to work on currency and proficiency if we can't start until june the same plan uh get the employees out here a week early to to, to work on that that's all we know right now um and uh um, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to troubleshoot and look at our options uh, for a May or June start date. Right, for Lewis or Brett, if a student signs up for the next flight course to take this summer, but flight ops is not reopened in time to finish the course that they are currently in, will they be guaranteed a spot in that course the next fall or this coming fall? So I'll take that one. Um, uh, it, would, it would require the student to sign up for that, that course in the fall um, through Ames, um, just like they would any other course. So um, provided space is available, they would, they would have to do that uh, uh, through Ames uh, to sign up for the next course. There's no, there's no process that will automatically take um, students registered for the summer uh, into a fall course, because obviously we don't, we don't know what section would work with your schedule so um, that would be something that the student would have to do for jeremy in the past year we've had we've we've been struggling to get students cfis classroom space and classroom instructors with the delay in many students graduating and an already shortage of flight instructors how do we plan on accommodating all the new students we will receive with our already stretched system yes yes 
less CFIs are leaving due to the airline slowdown, but it will be enough to ease the pain of the new students. Uh, I answered that a little bit uh, uh, already, but um, this summer we'll have the staggered approach to get everybody done. Um, I'm fully expecting CFI staffing to be up. Um, we are at 200 flight instructors right now, whereas previously we were hovering around 160, 170. So 200 right now and hiring in March, in May, in July with really no airline jobs out there in the short term means that we potentially will be at 250 flight instructors this fall. So um, I'm not too worried about uh, CFI staffing and, and uh, uh, student loads. It's, what's gonna happen is that a flight instructor isn't gonna have 12 students anymore. They're gonna have what, what they should have, which is six. Right, and for Lewis, how will flight points be credited towards ground school grades um, and how will that be handled for this semester? Um, so the, uh, the, the flight point gate that, that has already been passed. Um, so those, those points would have already been earned um, as far as flight points that remain for the stage checks. Um, that's something that we'll, uh, we'll consider and, and discuss. Uh, but as of now, uh, the flight points uh, would still apply to the first attempt uh, stage check uh, completion. So um, the student that doesn't uh, finish their flight training for a particular course will still continue to receive an SP. Uh, until that flight training is completed. And once the flight training is com completed, uh, the grade will be calculated and uh, we'll be able to obviously evaluate uh, the student stage check performance and assign those flight points accordingly. For Lewis, will students be able to move ahead in ground school over the summer even if flying is delayed or canceled in their current flight course? So that's, uh, again, another unknown that we would, we would have to kind of cross that bridge if we came to it. So, of course, you know, being right now, our intention is to resume flight training. Um, then hopefully you don't come across that. But uh, uh, if, if we were unable to provide flight training, we would need to reconsider our uh, ground school offering there. Um, for Jeremy, are any exceptions going to be made for those who aren't finished with their flight lab from the fall semester and we're working on finishing this semester in terms of retaking ground school? Uh, well, that's dealing with the August deadline. That, that's where you know, we're going to be polling, engaging, what's, how many students are coming back this summer and how many are, are unable to come back this summer and plan to finish up in the fall. Uh, but th these, this is part of our unknowns where we will address that um, uh, at, at a later date. But right, right now it's uh, what students are able to uh, return to Grand Forks when uh, uh, we're allowed to. So that, that, that's part of our unknowns right now. Uh, for Shane, how will AVIT 430 work over the summer given that half the course requires in-person simulator lessons? Okay, I'm assuming that's 480 and uh, uh, we um, fully intend and hope that we'll be able to do uh, flight training, but one of the benefits of 480 is the flexibility of the TCO. And so if we don't have, um, you know, it'll depend on uh, if and when we get uh, the allowance to do flight training. Um, if, you know, it's halfway through the session and uh, we only have, you know, half of the session left to complete, we can accelerate the flight course, we can make adjustments to the uh, lessons and make sure that uh, you know we get done. What we did in the spring session um, was uh, we we offered grades, completed grades for the class without completing the flight training, and we're we're capable of doing that because it's not a non-certification uh, degree uh, uh, certification course. We can do that outside of the 141 training. So. All right, for Jeremy, if a student takes their logbook home for spring break before records could finish processing a temporary certificate, should they send their log logbook in by mail for records to finish processing the temporary certificate or keep it with them? Uh, right now, keep your logbook. Um, just on a personal note, I don't trust the post office with these delicate documents. Um, I mailed my taxes in last month and they got lost and I sent it certified mail. Um, so. Right now, let's, let's hold off on sending logbooks through the mail. We, we might uh, um, have additional information here soon. 
And another one for Jeremy. Once we have all our classes completed, how will obtaining our degree work with a couple flight lessons remaining? Are we expected to come back to finish off three lessons if all our classes are finished? That's going to be up to the student. I mean, flight training can't be substituted. It, it uh, FA certification can't be substituted. So if, if uh, it's a matter of simply when do you want to do it? And uh, given all the other parameters that, that uh, students have, is that May, June, depending upon when we return, or is that uh, August? It, that's going to be up to the individual student. I, I would encourage them to reach out to the assistant chief or myself to discuss that scenario. All right, and then again, Jeremy, um, they're asking, is there a plan in place for the helicopter side of things? I'm hearing more CFIs and aircraft on the airplane side, nothing about helicopters. I, I can take that, because uh, I, I work directly with the helicopters. They're mirroring exactly what we're doing in the, in the airplane side. So what you're hearing about the airplanes is what you'll see for the helicopters as well. If we get operational in uh, May, helicopters will be operational in May, and they're thinking they're just going to mirror exactly what we're doing on the airplane side. And for Brian, what type of safety slash health mitigations are going to be in place when flight training resumes? That's a great question. We've been working on that for a few weeks here, but um, if and when we do return to flight training, it won't be as normal uh, as you've seen. So we have pre-flight procedures that are conducted during pre-brief where each crew would wipe down an aircraft. Um, our line and maintenance personnel are gonna wipe down the aircraft prior to um, the day actually beginning. Uh, we have adjusted opening and closing times. Now that may change as we hit summer. And then from dispatch procedure standpoint to limit social distancing, uh, we've we've put procedures in place to have as few people in dispatch areas as possible. So all those things will be covered through videos, training, um, as we get back into the swing of flight training. All right, for Brett, if we're able to do a flight course this summer, will students be able to live on campus? And since they already left campus and weren't allowed to come back, does that also extend into the summer? We um, don't yet have a decision from UND on how housing is going to be handled. So unfortunately, we don't have an answer to that question. Um, I would direct that question to UND housing. Jeremy, if we are still in Grand Forks, is there a way to get priority to be invited back to fly during the first wave of students you allow back? Uh, yes, that'll be one of the factors that we'll be looking at, but I don't want people to to use that to say, okay, well, I'm going to rush back to Grand Forks, but uh, th this is just an example of one of the many factors that we have um, in trying to determine uh, uh, who's on the flight line at first and, and who uh, uh, we need to come back in two, three, four weeks later. So that, that's one of the factors that, that we're considering. Right. Uh, for Brett, what does the freshman class look like given the current status of the industry? Yeah, that's a really good question. We don't know the answer to that. I mean, we expect that we will probably have a smaller freshman class than we have had previously. Obviously, it's um, going to be a, a tougher industry for a period of time. So um, while uh, the recovery is going on, there may be a drop in, in interest initially. So we would expect a smaller class, but we just don't know. So Brian, there was a question for you. Will Brian come out with a song regarding wiping down aircraft and social distancing? You're muted, Brian. Oh. I said, yeah, if I'm backed up by Dick Schultz, Jeremy Raisler, Lewis Archer, and Brett Van Heisen, we should be able to come up with some sort of a song. All right. Jeremy, will students who were finished with the oral portion of a state check, but not the flight portion, still have the 60 day period applied to them or not? Uh, right now, yes. That, well, it depends on the stage check, first of all. 
if it's an actual certification check ride, that's an FAA rule. There's, there's just no way around it unless uh, the FAA waives it, which I doubt they're going to do because we're talking about a check ride to award a pilot certificate or rating. If it's an intermediate stage check, we have some latitude and uh, we'll handle those on a case by case basis. Another one for you, Jeremy. Are all current flight instructors expected to need a stand ride regardless of when we open? Uh, well, it's, there's a lot of talk on what to exactly do. It's uh, um, from a currency proficiency standpoint, using the ATDs, um, I don't see us doing official stand rides across the entire fleet of CFIs. I, I, they're already standardized. We don't need to do it again uh, with a, a, a two month delay, but it's more about just getting the dust off things and making sure everyone is uh, safe to fly. All right, for Brett, for students who are relying on finishing flight training to graduate, should they expect to graduate at a later point or will they be allowed to graduate if flight training is not completed? I would expect that graduation would need to be delayed in that case. And for Lewis, will there be flight point templates for the summer courses? How will this be issued to those who are finishing up the prior courses? So I'm assuming that that's in reference to flight points as part of the academic grade. Um, that's, that's still something that we'll have to uh, um, discuss and come up with a decision. So uh, we're, I'm, I'm not ready to um, give an answer to that quite yet. All right, for Jeremy, is there a way that a student can submit information um, to get course cleared in the next few months? If they have all the requirements going to course clear and couldn't be completed but was unable to turn a logbook before flight ops closed, can they send that in in any way? Um, well, I mean, with that, getting a course clear and going into a stage check, every student's going to need a little practice before going into that stage check. So the time it takes to do that additional practice and proficiency uh, is when the course clear could be done. I mean, I'll, I'm going to take that information and and, and uh, think about things how we would go about doing that, but um, our record staff is caught up on pretty much everything. So uh, submitting a course clear right away when when uh, uh, we're allowed to open, uh, it shouldn't take too long to to get that course clear done. Another one for you, Jeremy. I'm still up in Grand Forks, and if you guys say that people who haven't left will be a factor into priority. How will it be handled if someone left and comes back at a later date? How can you prove that that person stayed will get priority when they say the same thing? Uh, it's a great question. I mean, we're talking about ethics. We're, we're talking about uh, professionalism. And a lot of our decisions and a lot of our guidance is based upon what's coming from UND, from the North Dakota Department of Health, and from uh, the state government. So. Um, if, if an individual wants to go against that, that that's, that's on them. And uh, um, I, I know for a fact we have both students and flight instructors that are putting up their own safeguards uh, looking for that kind of stuff. So, um, I mean, related to that, because uh, I've had it asked of me, uh, you know, if a flight instructor is not comfortable flying with a student because they don't know where they were last weekend, are they forced to do it? No, they're not. Same thing with a student. No one's going to be forced to fly and no one's going to be forced to pair up with uh, an individual if there's question about wh wh where they've been. All right. For Lewis, if you are one lesson behind the current template when the flight ops reopens, can they complete that one lesson to be able to register for summer ground school? Yes. So if they uh, provided that there is uh, capacity and space available at that time, uh, once they once they catch up to that number. Jeremy, will the March preferred new hire class be combined with the May new hires or will they be separate? Um, all the March new hires got an email from me twice saying that was the case. Um, so the March and May classes combined, and, and that date is, is uh, may have to be shifted based upon when flight ops is going to open. We're going to probably do some online training to, to kick things off. 
Um, I saw one question about the October preferred uh, reminder on that. We, we do not uh, offer the October preferred hiring anymore. That has nothing to do with the, the, the uh, coronavirus. That was announced uh, uh, months ago that uh, we're, we're no longer doing the October hiring. So uh, plenty of CFI hiring going on. So uh, I think folks need to concentrate on their flight training, concentrate on their academics, and the job opportunity will, will be there when, when ready. All right, and for Jeremy, are the stage checklists going to be cleared or is seniority going to stay the same as before flight ops closed? Uh, great question. I would say at this point, we're probably going to wipe them clean and, and let the AIM system take care of itself where students and instructors submit themselves again. And, and based upon the stage check pilots that are in town, um, AIMS will handle the, the reassignments. Like that. I'll follow up on that too. Is, uh, we did clear the stage check system. Uh, I was working with the standards department just because all returning students are going to need review flights to get ready and we don't want students sitting in a spot taking it up while they're reviewing for two weeks. So we're taking the philosophy that you got to be ready, then you belong in the stage check system. So it has been cleaned out. For Jeremy, should a student be required to repeat an oral first stage check due to the exceeding of the 60 day window, will the student be billed for the repeat oral? Great question. And I, I can use that information when uh, discussing with the FAA. But, but like I said, if it's a certification for a, a pilot certificate or rating, it, it is required by the FAA. We, we, we don't control that, the FAA does. Um, that doesn't mean everyone start calling the FAA. Um, but uh, I will express that concern and see what guidance uh, uh, we get from our FISDO. All right, question for Brett. For students who are finish ups from the fall, is it too late to drop or can you change to SU grading? The change to SU grading um, is only for classes that you're currently registered in this semester. So uh, that class would have been registered for a previous semester and you would have received an SP in it. So um, under my understanding of the, the change to the rules, you would not be eligible to change that course to, to uh, SU grading for this semester. Uh, for Lewis, is the system prepared to handle 1,400 kids trying to register at 9 a.m. on the 6th? Well, let's hope so. <laughs> I, yeah, it's uh, we've you know we've certainly had the the system in use for a few years now, and uh, we uh, fingers crossed haven't had any uh, major issues like that in the past. All right. This is a question for Dick. With all summer courses going online only, is there any communication with the BA about making exemptions as far as housing allowance being one hundred versus fifty percent? Um, I know there is some some discussion going on with the VA. Uh, I've seen uh, emails from that department going back and forth. I honestly can't specifically answer that question, but I know there is communication. I would, if you're a VA student, I would check with Carol just to verify. All right, All right for like we are slowing down on questions just a little bit. Within the next five minutes, we will stop taking questions. So if you guys have any last minute ones, do send them now. Uh, for Brett, a question is, will the PowerPoint be available to look at online? I was just typing an answer to that. Um, I don't think we intend to make the PowerPoint itself available, but this whole uh, webinar will, is being recorded and will be posted on UND's YouTube live channel. Um, this question is, will all of our aircraft be back up by the time we resume flying? I know that was kind of already answered earlier. Uh, I will answer that yes. We, I'll say 99%. You never know. But yes, all our aircraft are in good shape. Our maintenance is going through them. We're catching up on everything. So we will be ready to go. For uh, Jeremy, how are we going to get the archers back from Florida? Can a CFI who has stayed in Grand Forks apply to do that? 
Uh, well, um, going by current UND restrictions, any UND employee that travels to Florida has to put themselves in 14 day uh, self uh, isolation. So we're not, the, the deliveries are delayed uh, because of that just and, and out of respect for the safety of people involved. So we were supposed to take delivery of our pipers starting in two weeks. So uh, that is all delayed until uh, um, the, the conditions are, are safer and we're gonna start bringing those airplanes up. Right, would the ability to sit in the next flight course ground school um, before being done with your current flight lab be extended to the fall semester? So I can, I can answer that. Uh... That, that's, our, that's our intent at this time. Um, obviously, it's a fluid situation as we've discussed. So if, if we have uh, more changes that come down the line that things like that could be reevaluated, but uh, uh, that is our intent right now. Say hey, Zach or uh, Gretchen, this is Paul. Hey, Paul. Hi, Paul. Hey, uh See, I, I wanted to add to the Jeremy's question about uh, going and getting the pipers that just so everybody knows that any uh, or all university travel is uh, is not allowed at this time. And if there is, it needs presidential approval of, if, uh, to allow any travel. So that's another reason why we wouldn't be going down to get the planes. Appreciate it, Dean. Um, another question we have is if a student wants to just finish their current flight course and not start a new one in the summer, do they have to re-register or is there nothing they have to do? Uh, no, no. They, they, it, as long as a student has an SP and they're working on their flight training, they're, they're in the books for being active as a student. So they don't have to re-register for a course to finish uh, flight training that, that uh, is currently SP. And the next one, are non-certificate courses such as AVIT 389 able to have the flying deadline extended? I would say that individual needs to contact the academic instructor of that course. And for Brett probably, is there any possibility of having the Aviation Family Weekend rescheduled? I don't think we're going to be able to reschedule that at this time. I mean, we're, we're already looking at uh, this lasting through the summer and, and if we move into fall, you know, then we're, we're not that far from the spring session. So um, I don't think we're going to be rescheduling the, the family weekend or SAMA at this time. All right, we are doing, going to take our last couple of questions that have already been submitted. So we will no longer be taking any new questions at this time. The next question is, what is the course of action if we begin flight training and a CFI got the virus? Or I think a student could be included in that. Well, obviously, if something like that were to happen, the university is going to get involved. And in, uh, I guess, you know, I don't really know until we'll, we'll probably have that discussion. We'll do a safety risk analysis assessment here before we start the semester. And that'll be one of the things we will discuss. But if we did have a COVID-19, my guess is flight training would be shut down. Another one for either Dick or Jeremy. Will the launch lengths be increased in order to accommodate the new cleaning procedures? Uh, Brian Willis actually made a video of the cleaning procedures and we're talking about three minutes. Um, so it, it uh, um, we, we shouldn't need to put it that way. And this question is, does management have any plans to improve morale at the airport? Maybe like a barbecue or something, I'm not sure. We will assess the morale situation once we get our people back on uh, airport premises and we get a feel for what it is. We're pretty good about having a good feel for what that is. So we will deal with that situation as necessary based on how we come back. And for, Lew for Lewis, are there updated ground school times on campus connections since everything is moving to online for the summer? 
Um, so my understanding is we have submitted uh, the changes, but I don't believe that they uh, have appeared yet in Campus Connection. Uh, I have made the changes in Ames. Um, so once once Ames opens up on April 6th, that should be accurate, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not confident. I'm not sure on what the status of the Campus Connection list is. All right, if we can't fly in the summer, can we enroll in 480 in the fall without being done with 415? Um, I think I answered that one here uh, via text, but uh, um, we're going to reassess that. If we can't fly during the summer, we're going to have to look at it again. Uh, based on right now, the assumption is we're going to stay positive and say that we're going to be able to fly this summer and get, uh, get your 415 flight training done and we'll resume. Uh, you know, with that uh, prereq of uh, having the 415 flight training done in the fall. If that doesn't happen, then we'll reassess and we'll come back and uh, make another decision. And this will be our last question for the evening. Um, this will be for Lewis. Is everyone who is on template going to be accommodated for the summer sessions or are class capacities or number of sessions going to be increased? So we, uh, we obviously our goal is to accommodate as, as many students as we can, but uh, we have to, you know, consider there's a obviously a significant safety element there. We can't have, you know, 1400 students on the flight line at one time, as we've discussed. Um, so um, if we're aims, the, the benefit of aims is it allows us to, to manage um, or at least evaluate the demand we have for each of our courses. So uh, if those courses fill up and we have really long wait lists, then at that point we can, um, consider what our options are to accommodate uh, additional students. So um, it's it's going to be kind of a, a game time decision, I guess. All right. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us this evening for our 2020 Dean's Forum. I'd like to thank all of the students for coming out and answering or asking questions. And I'd like to thank all of our faculty for being here to answer the questions and give us updates. Um, if you do have any more questions, don't be afraid to reach out to your academic advisor. Um, and they should be able to answer some questions for you or direct you to the right place. Um, with that, uh, again, thank you all for coming. Thanks, Zach. Thank, thanks, Gretchen. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Good night, everyone.